Do your finances look like this? It's time to get your finances in order right now on The Leadership Voice. Welcome to The Leadership Voice. I'm your host, Jay Barbuto. Today's show is about the importance of financial literacy, and we have two financial experts that can show us the way. Joining us today are John Nguyen of JNF Financial and Brian Jones from 511 Tactical. We also have Professor Radha Bhattacharya to deliver today's leadership lesson. We have a lot of great things to discuss, so let's start things off with today's quote of the day. Today's quote comes from Jim Rohn, entrepreneur turned educator. The key factor that will determine your financial future is not the economy. The key factor is your philosophy. It's now time to introduce our first guest, John Nguyen. John is the founder and CEO of Fit Planning Group. A Cal State Fullerton alum, John has been an independent financial advisor since 2005. He's a certified financial planner, an IRS enrolled agent, and holds numerous California financial licenses and securities registrations. His clients include some of the higher wealth individuals in Southern California. John is a community and servant leader, volunteering his time, speaking to various classes, conducting workshops, and mentoring students on the importance of financial literacy. Please welcome a man with a great mind and a big heart, John Nguyen. Thank you so much, the pleasure is absolutely mine, thank you. Thanks for being <laughs> here. Me. So John, you've been a financial advisor for 17 years. Yes. How did you get into that industry? Gosh, when I was a student, I, um, I realized the foundation that Cal State Fullerton gave me was, um, was, was great, um, and I want to build upon that foundation. So I started quickly to say, hey, you know, what, what does it take to break into this industry and learn more? And all required was licenses, and I said, you know what, I have some spare time, and so why don't I tack on that as part of my, um, you know, my, my school regimen, uh, schooling regimen, and um, yeah, I got my securities licenses and insurance license in 2005, and uh, that's how I stumbled. I mean, that's how I started um, was education for personal education and then it built into a career pretty quickly after that. So that was... That so was you thought that. you were just investing in your, in yeah, your repertoire, additional, getting yeah, some education. additional finance training. Yep, and education, yeah. And it <laughs> just build. And then how did you balance? Because you, you started the business while you were still in school. Yeah, and... and, and um, you know, it, it was it was hard to balance. I, I mean, that's that's one thing I realized too was um, from one of my mentors is like, you know, I got to be honest with myself, and so I had to. It, it, I tried for a year doing both, and it was really hard. So I had to take a hiatus, you know, a little bit of a break, um, and uh, uh, yeah. So that's that's how I balance is that I, I realized what, what was you know opportunity cost. I remember my economics professor, you know, gave a great lecture about opportunity cost, and I said. Boy, I'm weighing the two, and and I'm I'm missing out a lot. I can always come back and finish, like in the summer or so, and uh, yeah, that's how that's how I found my balance. But I had to make a conscious decision to slowly kind of reduce my class size, and then and then um, because I started having traction for 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 the business, and uh, yeah, so that's how I graduated. You know, two years later <laughs> than than my original plan, but nonetheless, I had something to show for it. I guess, um, yeah. Absolutely. So how did you attract, I mean, your early career, you're yeah, in your 20s, yeah. you're, you're, you're still in school. How are you attracting these really pretty successful yeah. clients? Again, I, I do like to say it's my good looks and charm. Um, but no, it was, it, was, it was really because I had a strong basis of community connection. Um, I was very involved in, in um, our local community since high school. And so, um, and all these relationships just build and, and a lot of them became my mentors. And so, as I share with, with the, the group of people that I volunteered with, you know, and, and, and work with uh, in the volunteer in the community, um, they, they gave me an opportunity. They said, hey, John, why don't you 
take a look at my finances and, and you know, apply what you're learning. And, and uh, I was very grateful for that because obviously if I was getting clients that were my peers, <laughs> <laughs> there, there wouldn't be any money or, or, or any financial challenges that I can solve or, 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 or work with them, you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that, that, that was, uh, that's why it was, uh, I, who, who would have thought that those relationships became uh, the, the, the beginning career builder for me, right? And, and a lot of it was to start out with m myself and my family, right? And, but that can go so far because we didn't have much. But then again, I had to look for people that would give me an opportunity for them to uh, review their finances and allow for me to be a resource. Uh, they knew I didn't know everything, but they knew I was honest, sincere, uh, and they looked at all the work that I've done in, in the community and the projects that they work with. They said, sure, John, you know, and and that's that's one of the kind of the, the seed that I realized that personal finance is more of the personal, right? It's, it's a personal connection. Um, and then the finance was pretty straightforward, you know, so, yeah. So, yeah. so in the beginning, a lot of your early clients was you saying, "Could I practice? Yeah. Could, I, could, I, could I figure out how to yeah, do this?" Yeah, yeah, Can you help me? Help you, or, or help me kind of learn and apply? You know, it's hard to like you can't like you know to be a doctor, you have to kind of work on cadavers or begin with something, right? Like you have to have some real material instead of studying case studies and reading from a book and 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 learning from other people, right? You just have to kind of dive in, so. Yeah. So you've really been a lifelong learner, really. Yes, <laughs> still today, very much so today, yes. So let's yeah. let's talk about your uh, financial philosophy. What is your general philosophy for advising high wealth clients? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, I started with, with, with clients that are just slowly getting their finances together and then working with, you know, uh, high net worth, high profile, whatever, you know, clients that are, uh, they have a lot of responsibilities in the community. You know, they they run big companies, et cetera, small, mid-sized, big companies. It's um, it's really it's it's not so much. I'm yes, I I do give advice, but really they're looking to me to be a partner, um, someone who's who's a good guide and resource, and provide them with perspective. So I I, I serve as their CFO. Um, uh, personally for, for them and their family and and really be a like a sounding board um, it's it, one thing I've learned earlier in my field is is you got to learn to respect your clients and what that means is that it's on their terms right I'm not there to uh, pitch them anything I, I'm there to be of service and and so it's 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 different um, yes I started in the field where you're pushing products and services but um, as, as you work with folks who you know they're, they're not looking for that they're looking for someone who uh, practice what they preach, um, that have good values that they can connect with, um, and 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 who knows that they care a lot for that individual. So it's that personal connection, and um, yeah. So and, and and again, these are the folks that I don't you know market to or or, or target. It's all through referrals. Uh, it's all through relationships. So it, it's not. Uh, we don't have a marketing campaign or, or or it's none. And I prefer that way, anyways. It's again, it's a it, it's a. It's, it's a organic. very personal relationship. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a people it, it's people business as much as it is we think it's just all about the finance, right? So I'm very grateful for that, and and um, and that's why you know the uh, I guess it's my sense of community. So it comes very naturally. And again, I've been, gosh, doing this for 17 plus years. So um, <laughs> yeah, let's just say we don't do any marketing. You know, people Formal assume marketing. people mm -hmm. assume, and they, obviously mm -hmm. assumptions are never never healthy. Yes, but people yes. assume that high wealth individuals must be constantly making great decisions at every step of the way. Do, do, you, do you encounter some high wealth individuals that aren't always making the best financial choices? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a combination. And so, but, but they're humble enough to know that uh, they need a diversity of perspectives, right? I wouldn't say advice because again, they're the one, they're the CEO, they're making the decision, right? And so really uh, where my worth is, is to really uh, help them discern, help them really think things through and, and understand the pros and cons, right? There's not really, I don't think there's a really the perfect decision, really. It's like the best decision based on understanding the facts and circumstances and, and you know, the profile of, 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 of data, you know, that we have, right, information. So, um, yeah, it's, it's um, but, but what's great is, again, if, if they make wrong or you know, uh, decisions that weren't great, at least it's it's one that we can build upon, right? So, you know, kind of like the idea of you can stumble, stumble forward. Um, and, and having, you know, a diversity of um, of resources. I mean, you don't put all your eggs in one basket making, okay, I'm gonna put everything in this one investment or, or whatnot. So, um, yeah, it, it's, but one thing I've learned is that um, if they do lose money per se, or it's very temporary because there's 
ways for them to make it back. And it, you know, there's so many levers to pull, right? So um, it, it's really when uh, what really concerns me about a client is when they're they, they kind of lost that sense of like um, uh, uh, like commitment and and not just motivation, but like they're just like, oh, I just don't want to do anything anymore. Then then that's where you're really scared. But it's just little setbacks. It's perfectly fine, and it happens. There's no. <laughs> I wish I can see everything too, or they can see everything. And and again, we have blind spots, and so like that's one of my roles is to. Uh, um, uh, to be of service to my client to, to check those blind spots. Do you ever have you ever found yourself in situations where your client wanted to do something and you're thinking, <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's a good idea? Have you yeah, ever? Yeah, of course. Like uh, again, the, and, and it, it comes down to perspectives, right? And so uh, where I'm coming from with the information that I have, that's something that I have to. Uh, I want to make sure that I can honestly share and communicate. Um, but you, again, you got to respect the um, your client, and, and and that's a decision, and they have to understand that we all take ownership of our uh, of our decisions, good or bad, right? Just like mine. I mean, I can share with my clients certain things that didn't pan out as well, right? And and but but they don't. Yes, I, I take responsibility for that, but they understand that it, it came from you know these are the you know the information that I was given, and and these are the things that we discuss, right? So, it's um, yeah, <laughs> it's it's. Yeah. So I know that in your line of work, you'll do whatever the client truly wants because they're the ultimate decision maker. Yes. But what is your general philosophy when you're working with high wealth individuals? Is it just entirely client focused, option based? Give them all the options. Yeah, they... and 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 again, be a guide. Uh, that that's really it. it it's it's. Um, uh, I'm not the one telling them that I think I know better, or you know, if I were you, I would do that. That that's crossing the line. I mean, we have to be good. We have to provide good counsel, and, and what that means is. Is to um, uh, to provide feedback uh, uh, to empower the client to to make better informed decisions. You know, it's nothing like well, let me uh, let me sh let me share with you what I think it's better for you. That, that's not that's not the idea. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and I think that's how the relationships I have have, have built um, uh, has has really grown because again, it's a mutual based on mutual respect. But um, again, you got to respect the um, the client. And, and again, as long as they know. You know the pros and cons of that decision, the uh, the economic way on that decision, etc. Is that's it? And then I've done my job, and then some. So, yeah, that, that's. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about advising, financially advising higher wealth individuals. So let's talk about folks that are a little earlier in that journey. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, a little, maybe not necessarily younger, but maybe just less financially advanced or less right, financially right. accomplished. Right. What advice do you give folks who are maybe early career or maybe earlier in their financial journey right. um, about managing their finances and, and getting themselves positioned well? So um, you struck a chord with that question because you know that's my passion is to in empower. Um, students, young adults, to um, have the very best start, right? In, in when it comes to managing themselves and their finances, and you know, again, personal finance is more the personal part. It begins there, and so my advice. Uh, I'm not one to. I'm not really a fan of giving advice, but my perspective on the topic of personal finance and financial literacy and being good with your finances is look, you know, look at your values. Look at what. What has um, served you well to be in the career that you're passionate about? You know, and for you to get there, it takes um, accountability. It takes uh, being responsible. It takes initiative. Um, you know, it takes leadership, right? Um, um, and, and, and so much more. But those are the you know the four that I can I can think of as a foundation. Those are the actual the same uh, uh, the, the same qualities or, or traits that will make you very successful in your own personal finance. Because when it comes to personal finances. It's that it's it's being accountable, being responsible to your money, right? Really, the two currencies we have that we invest in and trade, and uh, you know, every day uh, barter, etc., is time and money. And so, when I look at someone who's, you know, just very um, uh, together, right? We can call that success. Again, they have a good there 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 there's a there's a good holistic uh, part in that. And so, it, it's it's really you know look look inward, um, and and begin with that uh, with that in mind. Um, and be the drive, so therefore you can be the driver of your finances, not the other way around. I think where people go wrong is they let their finances drive them, their financial goals drive them, where it should be their their, their values and, and their sense of wanting to to, uh, to be their very best um, in, in in many ways, right? Uh, then then that will, will will drive them to make those good decisions instead of just throwing money around or throwing their time around or being very irresponsible with those two very valuable. 
um, uh, commodities that you know uh, that they have to 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 invest in and grow, right? Those two things. So I think that's where the most trouble I find with young adults is is they lack that that connection, and so they make it just about the finance, but they forget like again. You're the driver, and I think with that in mind, that that, that really um, so builds up and solidifies. It gives a person a solid footing to then, you know, begin that journey. So early in that journey, it's important for us to really take stock yes. and take inventory of our values, yes. Yes. our purpose, our, our true yeah. goals, and what it really means to accomplish those goals. Yes. Yes. And then start making decisions that align with those goals. Yeah, because again, with with when you have more money, as you you know now have a career that pays more, or you didn't have to, you didn't have a lot of money. Now you have more of it. It just enhances you more, right? If you're a generous person, it makes you more generous. If you're irresponsible or reckless, it just makes you more reckless or impulsive. It it just amplifies. Um, and if you weren't prepared, boy, with having more things, that doesn't that's going to make you even you know in a position of of being reactive. And 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 there you go, right? And so. Um, especially where you didn't invest in yourself and surround yourself with a good team of people and and and, and resources, then yeah, you you'll be, you'll be uh, money is not gonna, having more of it. It's not going to solve your problems. So. so having a strong purpose, having a good sense of who they are and what they yes. value, and and be able to make decisions aligned, well yes. aligned yes. financial decisions. How will that change their life? Oh gosh, and and again, it will enhance so much more. Where you know, for me was um, I was able to retire my parents. You know, buy my house um, to be generous with my, t- with my time to still be involved with the nonprofits I'm involved with. Um, to be, I mean, and, and that. With that being said, I was better with my own personal finance. Obviously, right? It, it empowered me to. Uh, again, I was in this industry, so I can be good with my finances first and foremost, and for my family to be of service there. And then, and then, obviously, my my clients as well, and the people that I interact with, and the organizations that I belong to. So it it will enhance your life in so many ways. Uh, a mentor once told me that when I was getting involved in this industry, it was, if John, if you understand finance, you live twenty to forty percent better than the other person given the same financial profile. And I said, wait, what? If I learn this, my life is going to be enhanced by twenty to forty percent. Sign me up. However, in my opinion, as long as I've been in this field, I can tell you it's like five x to ten x. I mean, if you really understand finance, it, it's it's a great resource and tool that can really enhance your quality of life because that's what it's all about. It's not. Going out there and doing ridiculous things, whatever it is on YouTube, but it's it's it, it allows for you to uh, to be more not just purposeful, but you can really be of service to more people, right? And, and your family is a start, uh, and the people you care about, and obviously your community. So to make it even a greater impact. So I've really enjoyed this 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 conversation. <laughs> this is great, mind, yeah. and we're gonna have a uh, mm-hmm. panel discussion in just a few minutes. So you'll yes. stick around for yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. It's now time for a featured segment of the Leadership Voice. It's today's Did You Know? Today's Did You Know? comes from CNBC.com. In 2022, it was reported that 46% of employers offer financial wellness programs to their employees, which is up from 40% in 2020. This uptick is in response to increased financial stresses in the workplace. Offering financial wellness programs to employees attracts and retains talent, improves employee productivity, and improves their quality of life. It's now time for our Leadership Countdown. Today's countdown is inspired by Harvard Business School Online. Today we bring you five business benefits of financial literacy. Number five you'll be more financially efficient. Number four, you'll improve your negotiation skills. Number three, you'll be a better advocate for your team's budget. Number two, you'll make better informed decisions. And the number one business benefit of financial literacy is you'll better appreciate the financial impact of your decisions. Don't go anywhere. We have Brian Jones in the studio right after this break. The Bringing Learning to Work program is our way of connecting the faculty of Cal State Fullerton with the business community of Orange County and Southern California. We have over 72 training programs that are available via distance or face-to-face and the faculty come to your company 
and they deliver the training to your employees. The Bringing Women to Work program is really fundamentally, it's leadership programming. We do diversity and emotional intelligence training. We partner with Cal State Fullerton because they had subject matter experts in these fields. Um, and we're really fortunate and privileged to be able to do that. Many companies can't afford training and development personnel. And so this is a great opportunity to leverage Cal State's faculty to help them develop their learning programs. The leadership of the center and the students allow me to not only bring leadership development to my company, but allow me to interact with some amazing students who have grit, potential, and just amazing futures in front of them, and I get to take part of that. It's a wonderful feeling. When your organization is ready to develop its talent, reach out to the Center for Leadership, and we'll help get you there. Welcome back to The Leadership Voice. Our next guest is Brian Jones. Brian is the Vice President of Finance at 511 Tactical. In this role, Brian partners with key executive leadership to provide critical analysis and information to make strategic decisions, unlocking double-digit revenue growth and enterprise value for 511's owners. With 15 plus years of experience in finance and accounting, Brian has led teams across the globe while demonstrating an expertise in accounting as well as financial planning, analysis, and reporting. Prior to joining 511 in 2015, Brian was with Johnson & Johnson, Volcom, and Deloitte and & Touche. He also serves on the Board of Advisors at the Center for Leadership. Please welcome a close friend and a great business mind, Brian Jones. Hi, Jay. Nice to be here. Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit more about your background? You started out at Deloitte & Touche. Tell us, tell us what you did there. Tell us about that company. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jay. Uh, so joined Deloitte & Touche right out of my undergrad as a uh, public accountant, so in the audit function, and really just looking at companies' financial statements, making sure they're accurately recorded, uh, that they report out for the SEC and other public earnings. And then you moved to Volcom. Mm -hmm. And what happened there? Yeah, so I switched over to Volcom, still in accounting at first, but then that's really when I transitioned into forecasting. So got into the financial planning and analysis side and started looking at what does the next year or two look like versus on the accounting side, kind of looking backwards. Okay, and then Johnson & Johnson. Yeah, Johnson & Johnson, a little bit more of the same. So more financial planning, a little bit more granular, uh, focus on product lines, sales and marketing, looking at you know three-year horizons rather than just maybe one year. And what do you do at 511 Tactical now in your VP role? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so at 511, I uh, oversee both the finance team and the accounting team. So I have my accounting team who's really getting the financial uh, statements ready, looking backwards, then I have a financial planning and reporting team who's helping look at the one to next three-year horizon. So. You've got a lot of perspective from a corporate perspective on finances, both in terms of looking at the past as well as looking at the future. Right. So, and, and earlier in the show when we had John on, we talked a lot about personal finances and investments. Let's talk about how important it is for companies and leaders in companies to be financially literate and to be financially skilled. That's a great, it's so important. I think it's actually one of the most important things. Uh, historically, you've seen that the financial literacy has really been limited to maybe the CEO as well as the accounting and finance team, and that's pretty much it. And I think that that's a big, a big miss, a big loss. Uh, I believe that there should be a little bit of financial literacy at every level uh, from the bottom up. Uh, one of the things that a mentor told me early on was accounting is the language of business and the financial statements are the books. And no one needs to be necessarily fluent. I'm not looking for a bunch of CPAs at every level, but understanding how the business makes a profit, the decisions that the business is making and how it ties to your role, no matter what that role is, it couldn't be more important. And so how is, how is business finance different from personal finance? Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting that it's, it's not that different. Uh, there's some key differences that I'll explain, but overall it's not that different. One of the big differences can be time frame. Uh, personal finance is maybe a little bit more short term at sometimes could be long term as well as you look at retirement. And businesses tend to look at things very short term for the, you know, maybe the next year as well as maybe the next five years. But they're not necessarily always looking out, you know, maybe like a, over a 30 year mortgage or looking at retirement. So that's one slight difference, but it's not very large. Uh, the other one is levers. So when you think about as a business and they're trying to make a profit, 
we talk about levers. What are the things they can do? Can they increase revenue? Can they reduce costs? Uh, at personal finance, you have the same, but you are the owner of your own levers. You can pull whatever levers you and your family want that works for you. In a business, uh, an individual may not have that much flexibility in what levers they can pull. And what are, give me an example of some of these levers. Yeah, so from a business standpoint, the easiest one, um, or not the easiest one, but the quickest one is maybe reducing costs. So if you're looking at you know inflationary periods or the business has slowed down a little bit, maybe we pull back on some of our variable spend. So that would be like maybe travel entertainment, cut it back a little bit to match how our sales are trending. And maybe on a personal level, it'll be like, hey, maybe we don't go out to eat four times a, a month, it's three times. So those are the kind of things I'm mentioning. Uh, as levers. Yeah. And so uh, for a CEO, we say, well, we should reduce costs, we should do this. But what, 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 what can employees do? Um, maybe mid-level employees, yeah. or maybe even some moving towards senior level. But what are some of the things those folks can do to embrace mm -hmm. and, and leverage financial awareness and financial education? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I think it's two things. So it starts with financial literacy, and that comes from two ways. So it can be top down from a company taking on a, a mantra or a standard that, hey, we want our employees to understand how this business works and what, you know, when we sell something, what does that actually mean? Uh, what does that drive to what we call the bottom line where the earnings are? And so I think a lot of that starts at, you know, one of the examples I've seen at my current position at 5.11 is we've actually had during town halls, we've explained how the business works and what does it mean? Here are our financial results. We want everyone to understand. So someone thinking about financial levers and be like, ah, oh, how does that apply to me? Well, if you understand the business, if you understand the decision, you start to think a little bit more about maybe your everyday decisions or do I really need to go on this trip or do we need those supplies now? And yeah, maybe small, but in aggregate, it can be actually pretty material for a company. Yeah, even some of those smaller decisions, there could be better or worse decisions Absolutely. even within those. Absolutely. Um, I think sometimes people have a sort of a cavalier, it's not my money, yes. what's the difference? You know, it's just toner cartridges, who cares? Right. Or, but there really are potentially some, uh, some financial implications. So let's talk about some of the more common mistakes that we've seen. Um, financial mistakes yeah. by companies. Yeah, it's interesting that what you just ended with, I think that one of the first things is, is adopting a mindset of uh, the company's checkbook is also my checkbook, meaning that I need to treat these finances as if they were my own. So when you have a big disassociation between the spend and the employees, it starts to get like that where I'll order two of these rather than just one or you know I'll go and do this. So I think that's number one. Um, the other piece of it is, is making decisions without guardrails. Uh, I see that quite a bit where we're gonna make a big decision, we're not looking to find any data or we're rushing through the data, but we actually are having trouble measuring what does success look like? And you know, in business, a lot of times people measure success just as top line revenue, but it's not that simple. You really have to understand what is it we're trying to, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What's the data we have that can support it? And how are we gonna measure success going forward? So could you give an example of a guardrail? Or what, if I were making a, a business decision in my company, sure. what would be an example of, of using guardrails sure. when I'm making that decision? Yeah, a lot of times the, the thing that people will talk about earliest and the most will be, what's the cost of doing this? And so that could be your first guardrail is, hey, you know, you may ask for, okay, I wanna go implement new software, we'll say, and you may get a guardrail of what is that cost of cost of implementation. That's number one. That's usually the easiest. A lot of companies stop right there and they just get moved forward. But really it would be, okay, let's say you're going to put in a new software, a payroll system. Well, what is the metric? What is the reason we're doing this? It's not just a cost issue, but is it easier for our employees to use? What does that look like? Is it going to save us somehow? What does that saving look like? Because you really want steps along the way and milestones that says, oh, we are getting the benefit that we thought we would on, on whatever we're implementing. So those are the guardrails. Some people will think of them as ROIs, return on investment. That's certainly a good one, but sometimes they're non-financial metrics as well. So thinking about financial literacy, the importance of financial literacy in the workplace, what role do companies play in developing that financial advocacy, that financial literacy in the workplace? What role do companies need to play? I think companies need to play a, a pretty big role in, in helping with that. And so the, what I would say is it's been an evolution. I've seen in different companies that I've been at as well is 
the tried and true accounting team that usually no one really knows of unless their paycheck was weird or they need you know a, a, a expense reimbursement those days kind of have to end it needs to be a partnership so you really want so as for me and my team for a finance team and accounting team my goal is i want them out in the business partnering with people at at any level to help explain here's what we're seeing, here's what this means, and walking them through. Because what you'll find is if you're building that, and it really starts with Tone at the Top and then through the finance team, if you're building that, you start to have business partners that are coming and asking you questions before they even happen. Another way would be if you maybe don't have that is if you're an individual in a company and you know maybe like reach out to your finance team, reach out to your accounting team, ask questions, try and understand the business a little bit more if it's not being pushed, uh, pushed down. A lot of companies are starting to offer benefits, financial benefits, financial training and for their employees. Um, could you talk a little bit about why companies might want to start doing that? Yeah. And if they're not already doing it, I think 40% are doing it or a little higher. Yeah. So I think you'd like to see that number a lot, lot higher. So, that number should be a lot higher. So could you talk about the benefit uh, for the company? Yeah, absolutely. So maybe I'll, I'll start with a story of my own. So when I first started Deloitte, Deloitte's a massive company, great company to work for, especially right out of college, but it wasn't really a discussion. I luckily had a mentor who sat all the first years down and said, this is what a 401k means, and that's you know retirement planning, and here's why it's important today, here's what it looks like 20 years from now, and really helped us understand like why it made such an impact of doing making choices early. And that was just because he believed in it. Um, what I've seen companies start to do now is either they're, especially with retirement is a big one, is that they have, they show a total compensation package of benefits and showing here's what it means to work here. Here's what your salary is, but here's what your you know retirement benefits look like as well. One of the underused things for companies to do is they have a plan administrator for a 401k. Have them come out. Have them do lunch and learns with your employees. Explain the benefits of retirement, what they can do now, especially if you have a younger employee base. It makes a huge difference, and I think a lot of companies should be relying on that more because people are looking at their total compensation and benefits package more holistically than they may have historically. Oh, that's great. So thank you for this conversation. Absolutely. And we're going to have a, a panel. Uh, John's going to come back. We're going to have a little discussion with John and, and, and you. So you'll stick around for that? I, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks, Jay. Great. It's now time for our leadership example. Today's leadership example comes from purdueglobal.edu. Here are the top 35 personal financial apps and tools to help you manage your finances. It's now time for our leadership lesson. Today's lesson is being delivered by Professor Radha Bhattacharya, who is the director of the Center for Economic Education at Cal State Fullerton. I'm Radha Bhattacharya, and here is today's leadership lesson. To be a good leader, you need to embrace the economic way of thinking. What is the economic way of thinking? First, Resources are scarce. You can't have everything you want, so you have to make tough choices. Every choice will have an opportunity cost. Allocate your resources to their highest value. Second, as a good leader, you will recognize that incentives matter. People respond to incentives in predictable ways. Way back in 1914, when Henry Ford gave his workers in his assembly line a slightly higher than market wage, his workers' productivity increased. Third, voluntary trade makes everyone better off. For example, when companies voluntarily trade their carbon emission credits, it makes both parties better off and is also good for the environment. Fourth, 
There is no such thing as a free lunch. As a leader, you should not expect to get something out of nothing. Five, beware of the sunk cost fallacy. Don't hold on to a failing project just because you have already invested money in it. When Steve Jobs came back to Apple in 1997, he noted that the Newton, a personal digital assistant, was a failure. He decided to abandon the Newton altogether despite all the money that he had invested in it. True leaders like Steve Jobs realize that sunk costs that are incurred are gone forever. They move on. All that matters is whether the marginal revenue from your next undertaking exceeds your marginal cost. Next, to be a good leader, you need to understand the economic environment in which your business operates. The laws of demand and supply are inexorable. Monetary and fiscal policy impact the business world. Today's inflationary environment has occurred because of the massive increase in money supply and government spending during the pandemic and the 2008 recession. Being financially literate as a leader is anticipating that interest rates would have risen down the road. So there you have it. The economic way of thinking and understanding the economic environment is at the root of being an effective leader in a financially literate world. No wonder that many CEOs of major companies have an economics degree. Steve Ballmer, former CEO of Microsoft, Sam Walton, founder of Walmart, Meg Whitman, founder of eBay, for example. I'm Radha Bharacharya, and this has been your leadership lesson. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya, for that insightful leadership lesson. Well, we brought back our two guests, John and Brian, for our leadership panel. Thanks for coming back and joining us. Oh, yeah. Happy right, to be absolute here. Pleasure. All right. Fun. So we have three questions, and you'll each have a chance to answer every question, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion. The first question is going to be for Brian, um, but you'll both have a chance to answer it. So the first question is about resources. What technologies would you recommend people utilize to manage and optimize their finances? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a really important one. Uh, the first thing I'll say before I talk about specific technologies is one, it's got to be easy for you to use because you need to use it more than just the first time. You need to keep using it. Uh, two, it really helps if you have one that kind of looks at everything, both your cash in from either payroll, salary, things like that as well as cash out so you can start budgeting. Um, I've historically, I've used Mint, I'm also an accountant, so I use Excel quite a bit for myself. Um, but technologies like Mint will allow you to set budgets, keep your tracking, um, really help you look at a, a total picture. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces that's helpful is looking at a, a, the full picture. What about you, John? Yeah, um, you know, to what, what Brian said, when it comes to personal finance, um, let's relate it to like holistically, um, like with good health, right? Dieting, nutrition, and exercise, right? So in our world, it's a budgeting, savings, and investing, right? So if you can have a tool that can can manage that um, for you that you're comfortable with, just use it. I mean, I have clients that that um, you know you don't. Uh, everybody's different, right? We have different styles and habits. Um, I have clients where they use it on a like a journal, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and extremely successful, and they manage all their real estate on it, which is ridiculous because my partner is a CPA. You know, we digitize that for her to make it easier. But whatever is easier, I personally use Excel. Um, I use my banking app uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as long as again you have a good handle on things, and and um, that's really it. It's it's comfort. But I I, I wouldn't say there's one tool you know that is like that rules them all or or say. But like Mint is awesome. I have clients that use uh, Mint as well too. So uh, definitely. Um, and as a plug, we we have uh, kind of those tools uh, here at Cal State Fullerton through the you know Get Personal with Finance program. So that's uh, available. I mean, it's tailored towards college students, but anybody can use it. So, um, and I can talk about that later, I guess, or another time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's not so much which technology they use, but find a technology that you're comfortable enough so that you will, in fact, use it. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so these, these technologies aren't gonna actually help us if we don't 
<laughs> no, no. It's like having, you know, like a bookshelf of a lot of books, but you don't ever read them or ever use them. They're just, they look good, but they, you know, they don't mean anything to you. They got to be of service to you. All right. So our next question is about uh, what we call this, the turnaround story. And each of you will share your favorite anecdote or story about when a financial crisis became a financial success story. And John, you get to go first with this one. Yeah. So I have plenty of examples of, you know, we went through the pandemic and um, and then out of it, right? So during the pandemic, a lot of people got a lot of stimulus or, or they had a lot of time to themselves. So they invested, they made good pivots for their business, et cetera, and they became even more successful. So I don't think that's that, those are great stories, but not uh, not one that comes to mind, uh, especially that hits home to me, you know, getting personal with finance is, um, uh, I remember I was a student uh, here, uh, uh, you know, you, you make friends. And this is uh, one of the students when I was in the honors program here. So um, uh, later on, he became, well, his family became my client. And so uh, we put together a financial plan uh, for for um, his parents, uh, himself included, a, a small part. Um, but and uh, this was um, uh, in 2009, uh, so roughly just when I was about to graduate. Uh, long story short, about two years later, um, his dad passed away. And so talk about, you know, family crisis and an event like that that really changes a family's uh, personal finance, right? And so, uh, but thank goodness uh, we put things in place. Uh, yes, I invested uh, his his money and their money, a husband and wife, but, but uh, she was just a librarian, part-time librarian. He was the main breadwinner. And so long story short, I got this phone call on a Sunday in 2000, February, I can't remember, I forgot the exact date, but it was February 2011. Uh, it went to my voicemail saying, hey, John, uh, my dad just passed away at the age of 55. And so, um, hey, that life insurance policy you have, you know, it's still good, right? And so as soon as I got, you know, I called him back right away. I said, yes, absolutely. And I checked really quick on my phone because I, I was uh, uh, not at home. I was out and about. Uh, with my family, and um, but that assurance, um, talk about a crisis. And then I remember, I, I, you know, I track all of my appointments. It was the thirteenth meeting uh, when I was there um, uh, uh, for the family meeting. I was just expecting to meet with with her and, you know, the 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 three kids. But it was like the whole family was there waiting for my arrival to talk, you know, just to give them that assurance that things are okay and uh, and and that you know the the life insurance uh, check is going to be there. And so uh, talk about a, a rate of return. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, they funded about fifteen thousand dollars and they got over four hundred thousand dollars back. So I mean, what rate of return is that, right? All tax free too. So, uh, but because of that, it 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 really uh, protected the family's finances. And to date, she's she's well off. I mean, we because we budget everything, she still had a surplus every um, uh, every month. And so that that gave her that peace of mind. And, and she's doing very well now expect, uh, expecting grandkids. So it's just, um, that's probably the best success. It was the first one that I, I realized what I do is so important. I mean, just, you know, blocking and tackling just the, the foundation of financial planning is protection, right? And so had I not do that and just focus on investing, I mean, what, their money grew 20%. <laughs> what does that mean? You know, it wouldn't be enough. And so, and that was an alum, you know, also, and he was alumni here too. Um, so, um, yeah, so that that was uh, the one story. I mean, it still sticks to me today. That, that yeah. Brian, same same question. Can you share a turnaround story that, that you've seen or witnessed firsthand? Yeah. Uh, where we turned cri financial crisis into financial success. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a very powerful story. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. um, so for, for us, I, I'll go right to the pandemic because it was something that was in unique in that it affected all individuals, all companies, and it was an unknown. Uh, and so when the pandemic first started and people started working from home, the biggest thing that CFOs, VPs of finance, we all got in a room at every company and, and worried about cash. Cash was everything and we knew cash would be going down. And so the two things that really came out of that that I thought were really interesting. The first was it made you look at the business very differently. Uh, it made you look at where we're spending money and, and start to really think about, is that the best way for us to utilize this money? Is that the best process? And really focused on, are we as efficient as we think we are? Maybe we've been okay and we've been hitting budget, but maybe we could actually be much better. Uh, the second one was uh, it, it actually increased relationships. And I'll give you an example for, for me is, you know, as we looked at our cash and, and thought about it and some of our customers and their ability to pay, 
for the first time in my career, I picked up a phone and started calling CFOs at some of our customers and just got to know them and said, hey, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Let's work together. Let's talk about this. I don't want to just do this for emails or just assume that you can't pay or not going to pay and, and develop relationships that didn't exist before that are still ongoing today. Uh, and that was a big change and a really big success both for us as well as our customers in, in building that partnership up. So there really are opportunities. I guess anytime we face any kind of financial crisis, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a time that could define you in a negative way, but it also could be a wonderful opportunity Absolutely. to reinforce good principles and reinforce good habits. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's now time for our, our last question, which means that it's time for the final word. This is where we ask each of you to share your final pearl of wisdom with our viewers. And Brian, you get to go first. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I would say my, my financial or my pearl of wisdom would be if you are at a company, uh, your employees are very curious about the financials of the company as well as how it affects their lives. So I, I would really recommend working with your team and, and having some lunch and learns and having very brief learnings about the company and understanding the financials of it. And for employees or individuals, uh, be proactive. Reach out to some of your financial partners, your accounting partners, understand the business more and be, be curious. It's, it's going to help out both you and the company. So curiosity. Curiosity. John? Yeah. So, uh, you know, in my world, when it comes to personal finance, we use the term wealth a lot, you know. Um, and so uh, what I've, I've realized through, through my career and working with um, a diversity of clients is really the, the key to wealth or, or, or to, to what to recognize and, and how to realize wealth um, is gratitude. And I think that's, that's what's missing today is um, gratitude will help center you in, in so many ways. Um, because without that, then you're just chasing after money or you see flashy things and, and, and that's, that's now what's driving your finances again. And, and, and it's, and it's not your core values that are driving your finances and, and, and your goals and your quality of life goals. So, um, an attitude of gratitude is so important. I, I mean, it, it's, it, I have a big sign in my office in the re reception area that, that, that reminds people the importance of gratitude, right? Everything is around that theme. And um, so I can never stress that enough. Um, so that's a good way to really center your wealth, your finances, is begin w w with that um, with that attitude of gratitude w from that perspective. Gratitude, yeah. also a big big part of, of uh, that's a great, great pearl of wisdom for our viewers. I want to thank right. you both for being on the show. And there you have it, our final word. Thank you, John and Brian, for joining us. And we really appreciate you joining us here on this panel. Awesome. Yeah, thank you yeah, so much. This it was has great. been fun. So really thanks for paying us all this. Uh... Yeah, yeah take, <laughs> take as much as you like before yeah, you go. go. <laughs> yeah. Hurry, hurry, hurry. If you have a question or need advice, connect with us by email, leadership at fullerton.edu, or on Instagram at CSUFCFL. So that puts a wrap on today's show. Thank you to our featured guests, Brian Jones and John Nguyen, as well as Professor Radha Bhattacharya for delivering today's leadership lesson. Join us each episode of The Leadership Voice, where your continuous leadership development is our daily purpose. I'm Jay Barbuto, and on behalf of the Center for Leadership here in the beautiful campus of Cal State Fullerton, we'll see you next time right here on The Leadership Voice.